Act One of The Bow's Duel or a Soldier for the Ladies by Susanna Sentliver. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Prologue by a Gentleman. What hazards poets run in times like these? sure to offend uncertain whom to please if in a well-worked story they aspire to imitate old rome's or athens fire it will not do for straight the cry shall be tis a forced heavy piece of bombositry if comedy's their theme tis ten to one it dwindles into farce and then tis gone if farce their subject be this witty age holds that below the grandeur of the stage our female author though she sees what fate does the event of such attempts still wait with a true british courage ventures on thinks nothing honour without danger won she fain would shew our great forefathers days when virtue honour courage wore the bays fain would she kindle up those fading fires that warmed their noble blood to fierce desires when the bold hero after tedious wars with bleeding wounds adorned and glorious scars from conquest back returned with laurels crowned where from the fair their just rewards they found she thinkest a crime in any one to dare or hope to gain a conquest o'er the fair who ne'er could boast a victory in war let but your arms abroad successful prove the fair at home shall crown your toils with love dramatis personae colonel manley in love with clorinda read by adrian stevens captain belmine his friend read by elijah fisher toper an enemy to matrimony and a friend to the bottle read by todd sir william mode a fop in love with clorinda and countenanced by her father read by beeswax candle ogle a fortune hunter a conceited fellow that fancies everybody is in love with him read by greg giordano careful father to clorinda read by inco clorinda in love with manly read by valroth amelia her cousin an heiress newly come out of the country read by jen broda mrs plotwell formerly a mistress to belmain read by sonia mrs flora clorinda's maid read by inco mrs plotwell's maid read by elsie selwyn drawer read by redrun sergeant read by redrun laric as la riviere servant read by alan mapstone toby read by alan mapstone footman read by david purdy porter read by jim locke land the tavern keeper read by inco stage directions read by christine rutger the scene london act one scene one scene the street enter colonel manley how do men labour to fool themselves what pains did i spare or excuse did i not invent to persuade my friends i was going another way to get rid of their troublesome ceremony that would have waited on me home and all this for an opportunity only of taking a turn or two before this window oh love how powerful are thy charms thus to unman and send me like a boy gaping after imaginary joys 
not all the hazards of a soldier's life could so much affect me as the dreadful apprehension of displeasing this girl whatever i do whether i eat or drink whether i sleep or wake whether i'm at home alone or abroad in company my thoughts are still of her she's always present i can see nothing but her i can hear nothing but her i can think of nothing but her and in short i care for nothing but her it is happiness enough for any man to love and be beloved by such a woman she's so beautiful so agreeable and so loving yet so virtuous so chaste and so constant that if her father's rigid opposition were removed nothing could add to the blessing which lies in store for me enter captain belmain who goes within two or three yards of the door then stops short looks up ho oh, this must be the house but what the devil am i the better for it the doors are locked windows barred my mistress asleep and i may return like an ass as i came without so much as being dreamed of can love that never fills its voratories at a pinch inspire no stratagem now egad i was never more able to offer him a plentiful sacrifice and did my mistress know with what warm desires i come she'd meet me half-way or she deserves to die a maid the more i think i still perplex myself the more like a poor fly in a spider's web by labouring to get loose i work myself faster in the toil and why should i struggle any longer with what i can't master or desire to be without what i'm persuaded is the greatest blessing in the world i am resolved i will love on turns short upon the captain ha a man and if i mistake not mad belmine whom i left at the rose he's upon some amorous design but is too open to hide anything from his friend i'll accost him good morrow captain i commend your early industry you are choosing some fortified piece of virtue to lay a manly siege to ha colonel good morrow to you with all my heart no faith i never stay the formality of a siege tis your honourable lovers are forced to undergo that drudgery whenever i meet any as rarely do that resist the shock of my first assault i fairly draw off to the next who are sure to surrender upon more easy terms so you take all by storm plunder the garrison fire their quarters and march off in triumph what i do can't be comprehended by constant pulling lovers they can't bear those strong joys we suck from our lusty draughts of love like weak-sighted birds they fly about in twilight of pleasure not able to bear the meridional heat and pleasure of it one kind glance crowns your hopes and raises you to the highest happiness but then a frown or sour look colonel throws you down again to despair so that have a care captain how far you launch out in this train lest you be too like our modern widows who exclaim most against a second husband when they are just upon the point of having one so that from my laughing and honourable lovers as you call them you unlearnedly infer i am one myself nay raillery apart it has been seriously observed that you are what very much altered of late how faith i think myself the same man i have the same appetites the same desires that ever i had ay but you saunter about in solitary places avoid your acquaintance 
and when you can't escape them are more uneasy than a rich miser with a borrowing friend and here now i find you out of your way addressing yourself to senseless wood and stone ay my friend but this senseless wood includes a more beautiful daphne than e'er the delian god pursued a girl so bright so sparkling and what recommends her much more to me so coming embraces him that had she lived in the days of venus she would have rivalled that goddess and outdone her too in her own attributes have a care you don't misplace your worship for to my particular knowledge no such person lodges in this house to my more particular knowledge such a person does lodge in this house and in the room that looks out at that window too colonel manley aside ah clorinda lodges there tis true but that she's such as he describes is false yet she's a woman and where dissembling grows so much in use perfection must be a stranger i'll for a while lay by the implicit lover for the more inquisitive jealous man and try him farther well i may be deceived but how do you know you are so too why faith since i know you to be an honest fellow and a man of honour i don't care if i trust you with the secret upon condition your assistance shan't be wanting upon occasion colonel manley aside it's life i shall be drawn in to help him away with my mistress if she be such as you describe i believe you will have no great occasion for help but to the purpose why you must know that in this house lives a damned positive ill-natured old fellow colonel manley aside i know it too well or by this time his daughter had been out of your reach and that there's a young lady his daughter niece or something ay very probable what then why that likes my person that's all how do you know this know it i have infallible signs of it she makes assignations with me and keeps them receives my addresses letters and songs nay sings them too and if there had been signs she likes me the devil's in it well but her name aside i'll yet believe clorinda innocent and tis some one else he mistakes for her nay now faith colonel you are unreasonable you know tis not fair to tell names not tell me her name then i shall think you trifled with me all this while and scorn the friendship i offer i'll rather tell you all i know but as for her name faith and troth i know no more hers than she does mine her desire to be unknown herself made her the less pressing i suppose so that we freely pass among ourselves for caledon and clo as you may see by this song if you'll be at the pains of reading it tis the last i send her and though inconsiderable in itself receives from her voice inestimable value colonel manley aside oh my soul the very song i heard clorinda sing tis she past all doubt what at a stand colonel ha what means all this concern tis for you my friend that woman you admire i know to be the most cunning treacherous and false dissembler nay worse if worse can be in the world i would advise you to proceed with caution for husbands captain too late repent when they can't quit the ill oh if it be only my dangers that disturb you i'll soon ease you of that trouble marriage is not the course i steer 
we never admit so sour a thought to turn our more pleasant conversation how not marry what then does all this tend to oh, that's unreasonable again why nothing nothing but a little harmless mirth or so colonel manley aside oh my soul he designs to debauch her captain belmain aside ha the colonel in his dumps again there's something in it i don't understand hark ye captain i know you have courage and always took you for a man of honour therefore think it worth my while to tell you this woman you have been so free with is one i have long time loved therefore expect you'll give me unquestionable proofs of what you have said or meet me with your sword and so leave you to prepare yourself for which you think most proper going captain belmain aside hey day have i been all this while making a confidant of my rival and telling my secrets to the only man i ought to hide them from now i perceive which was made him so testy but he shan't part thus look ye colonel to show how much i value your friendship i'll consent to what you propose and though fighting may be of less trouble yet for your ease i'll undertake to make out what i've said upon that condition i'll call you friend again but if you should fail you had best look to it here's some company coming this way let's retire till they pass then i'll tell you our whole intrigue and leave you to judge whether i have reason to think as i do they withdraw enter sir william mood le riviere sir listen me if you don't speak plain english i shall have the world think i'm such a sloven as to keep an english fellow do you hear if you don't mimic it better i shall turn you away me will take all the care imaginable sir very well is the music all come yes sir here be the fiddle the old boy the courtel and the bass viol they be all disposed for to receive your command tis very well dear do you marshal them in order before this window and see they be ready to strike up as soon as i give the word the colonel and captain appear what the devil's here another lover what think you now colonel your mistress must be more than women if she can hold out against such a formal siege this fop i know too well to be jealous of and know her so far from encouraging him that her father's authority which countenances him can scarce procure him common civility from her hist the thing opens well tis an unspeakable happiness we men of parts enjoy above the rest of mankind by our good management we make our access to everything we admire easy and certain how many thick-scowled fellows are content to dream of their mistresses while well, i take a more secure method and wake her in the morning with harmonious music i wonder how the ladies can suffer these idle fellows that take no more pains to please them for my own part i believe i have something extraordinary in me that makes me so acceptable to all the women i come in company with well music i hope you will all show yourselves masters in your performance come strike up ah oh, merciful apollo what a hideous noise you make there's a sound fitter to storm a breach with than approach a lady's slumbers play some soft air concert of flutes would have done well while the music plays he uses a great many odd postures seeing the door open the music ceases and he runs to meet clorinda's maid how the door open 
Oh, my dear angel, how does my goddess receive my morning sacrifice? As she does everything that comes from the incomparable Sir William Mode, with particular marks of favour in private, though she's obliged to lay great restraint on her carriage in public, to appear cold to him. But methinks she need not be reserved, since I have her father's consent. Aye, tis that makes her so, for his cross humour, should she show the affection she really has for you, would make him run counter to what he so eagerly pursues now, out of mere opposition, for he never opposed Colonel Manley till she expressed some liking for him, and now she fears, should she owed her love for you, it would prove it's fatal to her hopes, therefore begs you, by me, to take all indifference in public for particular marks of favour. Well, I'll take your advice, and sweet Mrs. Flora, let me entreat you to accept of this small acknowledgement for favours I have received by your means. Oh, Lord, sir, I vow I'm ashamed, but I shall be always ready to do your good offices with my lady. Sir, your servant. Exit. Adieu, angel. Hear music, strike up a merry ramble, and lead to my lodgings. Exit. Oh, woman, woman, now, friend, I believe all you said, and a great deal more, yet who could expect with so much beauty such ugly falsehood? For thee, or any man, she might have some plea, but this sign of a man, to fall so low, argues a very depraved appetite, death i can't bear the thoughts on t have a little patience and every small discovery will help you forward to your lost liberty before to-morrow night i'll lay such convincing proofs before your eyes as shall infallibly complete your cure what's here another serenade more lovers yet enter toper singing the devil a bit care I for a wife, so I have but wine and a fire. A wench, when I please, my passion to ease, the devil a wife I desire. Ha <laughs> ha, drunken toper, reeling home after a night's deep bodge. Sure he's no lover. "'Twould be impossible for the blind god to find his heart for the fumes of wine. Besides, tis so indifferent to everything else, there's no taking it but with a bottle. "'Ha! Topa, thou holdest thy own yet, I see. "'Colonel, good morrow. I wish you hold your own, boy.' For I met a thing in the next street may chance undermine your foundation. One who says he can do more in one night than you in all the days of the week. What do you mean? Why, I met Sir William Mode, big with success, returning from Clarinda, who, he says, encourages his addresses in private and only favors you in public to egg her father on to consummation with him and this he purchased with a serenade steth doth he boast of his success and must my misfortune be the subject of the coxcomb's raillery am i published to the world as a blind for his designs hell and furies tis not to be borne I'll after him immediately, and were every vanity about him a Hercules, I'd force my way through them all to stop that foul breath of his. Going. Hold, hold. You will but widen the sore you design to heal. Twill be no hard matter from the coxcomb's fruitful impertinence to take another occasion for quarrelling, and then pay old scores. Or, if it be my luck, first to meet the opportunity. You may be sure I'll throw in a hearty thrust for you. Nay, sir, you may save yourself the labor of quarreling, for he won't answer expectation, I assure you. A coward. Nay, then he shall dance a minute the length of the street, while it be time on his backside. Hang him! 
He's not worth our resentment. Prithee, Toper, what is he? For I have but barely seen him. In the first place, he's a mere compound of powder, paint, and affection. So perfumed you may smell him a mile. He thinks every woman in love with him, and will allow no man to claim a share in aught above a chambermaid, or stand competition with his parts or person. And yet not fight, say you? Fight? <laughs> no, no, he hates the sight of a drawn sword, as much as I do that of an empty bottle. He will sometimes pretend to courage, as some women will to honour and honesty, though their inclinations tend to neither, no more than mine, to matrimony. He has four thousand pounds a year, which he spends in intrigues, fine clothes, and music, and he has always as many fiddlers at his heels, as the general, officers at his levy. Whose attendance is better rewarded, I fancy? No doubt they taste the fruits of their labours sweetly. In my conscience, I believe they deserve it. For who becomes his favourite must use as much flattery as would purchase a maidenhead, though the woman's design was marriage. Ah, oh, that fortune should be so liberal to such a fool, when so many honest fellows fit in a coffee-house all the evening for want of money to go to a tavern. Riches are the common chance of knaves and fools. Fortune is rarely favourable to man of sense. Tis with difficulty and danger they purchase a smile from the fickle mistress, but fools are still her care. I shall take more notice of this fellow the next time I see him. Which may be this morning, if you will, for he just now invited me to an entertainment of music that is to be performed at his chamber by some of the best masters. There will be champagne, boy. Will you go, Colonel? Not I. The conversation of town ladies who entertain you with the opinions of fifty fools of their wit and beauty, and how managed by them to their ruin, would be a thousand times more acceptable to me than the medley chap of fops and fiddlers. Then you won't go? No. I'll expect you at my lodgings. Exit. But you will. There's champagne, box of the company. And music, too. If that be good, the company be hanged. Exit. Scene changes to Clorinda's lodging in her father's house. Enter Clorinda and her cousin Amelia, undressed as waked by the serenade. Dear Amelia, you ask so many questions. Prithee, have some pity and spare me a little. Dear cousin, do you pity me, and answer me a little? I have answered you these three days you have been in town. More questions than all the astrologers and philomaths in London could resolve in a month. And I have as many more to ask before I can be satisfied. I'd fain know the cause of all this alteration. Why so much uneasiness, and why so much spleen? Never pleased but when you are displeased, nor like your company, but when you are alone. In short, I have observed. What have you observed, cousin? Why, that your father is never well, but when talking of Sir William, nor you pleased, but when you are thinking of somebody else. Oh, how inquisitive are girls! <laughs> oh, how reserved are lovers! Prithee, cousin, learn to be more serious. Prithee, cousin, learn to be more free. Then you positively believe I am in love? Positively. And with? Another guess man than your father designs for you. And nothing? Will persuade me to the contrary. Why, then I am. And since tis in vain to hide it from you, Amelia, 
I'll try you with the confidence I hitherto thought you too young for. Amelia aside. Alas, she little thinks I have as great intrigues of my own as any she can trust me with, though I have been but three days in town. I am, as you see, cousin, besieged night and day by two as different as night and day one in the head of innumerable fopperies and insolences attacks me with the assurance of a conqueror before he enters the field being supported by the harsh authority of a rigid father the other after a thousand obsequious demonstrations of love at respectful distance courts to be admitted mine rather than seeks to have me his in my conscience were it my case i should not be at a stand which to choose there being such apparent difference nay there is more yet for one is generous and brave the other cowardly and pitiful one judicious t'other impertinent one constant t'other whimsical one a man of sense t'other a blockhead one admired by all t'other ridiculed by all one i suppose is the gentleman that gave the serenade sir william of whom i have heard so much since i came to town but the other clorinda i fear is nowhere to be found such men appear but as they say the phoenix does not above one in an age and that ours has one in him the judicious part of mankind bears witness lovers clorinda like people in motion fancy everything they see moves as they do and maybe from the knowledge of your own principles and resolutions you form your notion of his aside now could i almost find in my heart to discover my own intrigue if twere only to let her see there are men that equal if not exceed hers but that i'm ashamed of its forwardness in so short a time but how comes it cousin that we never see this man before you came to town my father forbid him in the house with any further pretensions to me upon sir william's account to whom his honour was engaged before he saw him or else i believe his follies would have outweighed his estate for he you know i know too much of him for i have seen him so you have t'other too he was one of the two that bowed to us t'other night from the side-box and of whom you have since been so inquisitive though i never let you into the secret till now of one of those aside i know a secret which i believe you are a stranger to and which i would not for the world discover till i know more on it if that be he i like him as well as you can but i think a gentleman of sir william's estate should not seem so contemptible oh dear cousin don't name him for besides the particular aversion i have to him twould be get in the world a very slender opinion of my sense should i encourage such a fop oh quite contrary besides cousin if you hate him you can never get it in your power to torment him more than by marrying him that would be making myself uneasy purely to trouble another no no i must have some contrivance to expose him and our neighbour mrs plotwell shall help me do it does that lady still continue her persecution of fops mm -hmm. with as much address and success as ever and her pleasant accounts of her feigned intrigues makes her very entertaining company she hates sir william mode and i am sure will assist in anything i never had a stronger temptation to disobedience than now love and merit plead on manly's side reason too approves my choice the other's an empty nothing a mere talker we'll show his right side expose him shall we not my dear with all my heart i love mischief so well i can refuse nothing that farthers that end of the first act
Act Two of The Bow's Duel or a Soldier for the Ladies by Susanna Sentliver. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. Scene Sir William's Lodgings. Enter Sir William in a nightgown, looking in his glass this rising early is the most confounded thing on earth nothing so destructive to the complexion it blister me how i shall look in the side-box to-night wretchedly upon my soul looking in the glass all the while yet it adds something of a languishing air not altogether unbecoming in my candlelight made all mischief but i must stay at home to recover some colour and that may be as well laid on too so it is resolved i will go oh tis unspeakable pleasure to be in the side-box or bowed to from the stage and be distinguished by the bows of quality to have a lord fly into one's arms and kiss one as amorously as a mistress and then tell me aloud that he dined with his grace and that he and the ladies were so fond of me they talked of nothing else then says i my lord his grace does me too much honour then my lord pox upon this plate is not worth seeing we had been seen at t'other house to-night and the ladies will be disappointed not to receive a bow from sir william he he says i my lord i'll wait upon your lordship then says my lord lead the way sir william oh pray my lord i beg your lordship's pardon nay sir william then pray my lord enter la riviere pray sir william pray my lord as he says this several times, La Riviere enters behind him, but as he designs to pass by him, is still prevented by his turning from one side to the other, as he acts himself for the Lord. Hey, what the devil is he conjuring and talking with invisible lords? he's in his ears some pleasing imagination hurries him out of his senses but i must to my cue hmm, hmm? sir there be one two gentlemen below come to wait upon you this morning shall i show them up no my lord by no means i know better things la riviere aside what then am i a lord egad i never knew my quality before sir william aside pshaw this blockhead has roused me from the prettiest entertainment in the world well what would you sir i will tell you sir there be one two gentlemen wait upon you and let him wait till i have done aside i had a thousand fine things to say upon that occasion but this rude fellow has frightened them all out of my head well since my better diversion is over show him up yes sir exit la riviere enter captain belmain and toper gentlemen i am your most humble servant mr toper i am extremely yours for the honour you have done me in bringing your friend i lay under severe apprehensions that nothing could engage you but a drinking bout faith you were in the right for if your campaign had not more charms than your music your fiddlers might have played by themselves for me if how unpolished how barbarous that is why do you expect any other from him he admires no music like wine rattling in the throat of a flask with a chorus of drawers at coming sir and that to me is the most nauseous thing under the moon impair my vigour 
Impair my vigor? <laughs> Very pretty, Faith. Prithee, where didst get that affirmative? Tis my own, at the purchase of some day's study. For to use another man's oath is, in my opinion, as indecent as wearing his clothes. And to be in the road of the vulgar is beneath a gentleman, who, in my judgment, ought to be as much distinguished by his expressions as by his coach and livery. Right, sir, for since every body that has money enough sets up an equipage, a gentleman ought to find out some other way of distinguishing himself. Oh, my conscience, they will ape us in that, too, for they are so proud of following their betters that they even tread upon their heels. Not a formal chit or awkward liar's clerk that won't court the cook wench a quarter of a year for oil and flour enough to garnish out his wig for a day, that he may impudently mimic a bow. If twere not beneath me, I could kick such animals to a jelly. How? Oh, kick em to a jelly? Why, I have seen of that kind you talk of, brawny fellows that could kick and cuff too stoutly. Ay, that may be, but tis not a gentleman's business that always wears a sword and has some half-dozen of footmen at his heels to kick and cuff, nor stand and consider whether the mechanic be armed or not. Tis enough that he is, or but thinks he is affronted to atone for the life of a scoundrel. Captain Belmain aside. Now, wouldst this ass, rank coward as he is, if not curbed by the law, kill a hundred men, honester and stouter than himself, only because they don't wear swords, or are not so finical? I should think, Sir William, these honest people that wear no swords, very harmless, because they carry no instruments of mischief about them instruments their very hands their dirty clothes are instruments of mischief look ye sir i'll make it very plain to you i may lawfully kill a man in my own defence that comes armed in terrorem to rob me of fifty pounds right sir you allow that we do then i'll prove the rest in an instant I have a new suit on that cost me fifty pounds. Here comes thundering by a dirty drayman with his cart that puts me in bodily fear and rushing rudely by daubs all my clothes so that I can't wear them any more. Now here's fifty pounds lost by this rascal's dirty clothes if I don't prevent it by running him through the body. How? Kill a man for wearing dirty clothes? <laughs> The law makes better provision for men's lives. The law should make better provisions for men's clothes, too. For the insolence of the vulgar is insufferable, and if one or two of them were made examples, the rest would be more civil. One night after a play, I waited on a lady from the box to her coach. Comes a clumsy chit with a poultry mask out of the gallery, rushed against me, threw down the lady's page, brushed all the powder out of my wig, then cried, Ha, 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 we have ruined the bow. Had I been a lord, I would have run em through the guts. But to be tried by a Middlesex jury is the devil. Ay, these vulgar, as you call them, have a greater respect for one another than to suffer that man to escape that kills one of them. But I suppose your principal concern rises from your loss of the lady's favour. It had no such effect on her, I assure you, sir. Wherever I get a footing in a lady's esteem, I stand too firm to be jostled out by a chit. As, for instance, I'll give you another adventure of mine. Being engaged by appointment to meet a lady at White's, and detained by some extraordinary business, the lady chanced to be there in her coach as soon as I arrived in mine, so that lighting out of my coach to go to hers, a nasty fellow running just against me almost beat me backward, and, though he did it designedly, it cried, Zooms, can't you see? Your wig blinds you, does it? So taking one side, gave it such a 
toss of my shoulder that had not the lady been passionately in love with my person, the disorder I appeared in might have spoiled my amour. Enter servant and whispers. Incredible coxcomb. Pox on him. I'm weary of him. There's no variety in him. Come, shall we go? No, prithee. Stay a little till we see what becomes of the music. Of the champagne, you mean, Topper. <laughs> a gentleman? I'm the most unfortunate man this day alive. Why, what's the matter? A cursed mischance has robbed me. Not of your wine, I hope. Nor your mistress? No, but of Mr. Quaver. Why? Is he dead? Not quite dead, but an unlucky accident has put it out of his power to oblige us with his incomparable voice. Is he run through the body? Or drunk before dinner? Uh, no, no, gentlemen, but he has scalded his mouth by drinking his chocolate too hot this morning and can't sing. <laughs> a sad mischance indeed enters servant and whispers and then goes out and brings in a letter prithee toper who is this fellow he laments so much some rascal that finding his weakness imposes on him no tis an intimate friend of his one as whimsical as himself and truly fit for no other company he made shift in a month's time to purchase the displeasure of most of the quality in town in spite of some excellence he has in music toper aside and now is become fit entertainment for such fops as this who after the strictest engagement will be put off with trifling excuses you see, gentlemen, how I spend my life. I divide the greatest part of it between love and music. To make amends for the disappointment of one, fate has sent me some new discovery in the other. A new amour enfeebled me, for upon my soul, gentlemen, I never saw the hand before. And to convince you of its novelty, I'll open it fairly before you. He opens, and Toper looks over his shoulder. Reads. Sir William, I beg the favour you'd meet me. Aye, as I said, gentlemen, prithee, Toper, read out. While he reads, Sir William capers about. A billet do, do you call it? Tis the most masculine one I ever saw. An invite to rougher entertainment than you imagine. Tis a very pretty billet do, truly. Shall I read it out, Sir William? I prithee, dear Taper. Sir William, I beg the favour you'd meet me behind Montague House at six tomorrow morning, with your sword in your hand, in order to answer what shall be alleged against you by yours as you use me, roughly. A billet do, do you call it? Why, tis a challenge. Huh. Taking the letter and looking upon it. Be so, impair my vigour. Now blister me if I did not think it as plain a billet do as ever I read in all my life. Where did the porter say he brought this letter from? From Will's Coffee House, sir. The devil he did. Why, what if these men of the sword encroached upon our privilege there too? What business can they have amongst us bow and poets? What shall I do? For in short, I won't fight a man I don't know. And gentlemen, I vow I don't remember I ever saw this Mr. Ruffley in my life. Oh, he's a damned fighting fellow. Your only way is to send him word you'll meet him on Calais Sands. Dueling is unsafe in England for men of estates. He'll hardly be at the trouble of going over, so that if he will fight you, he must draw upon you when e'er he meets you. If so, you'll have both the mob and the law on your side, and if you kill him, you need not care a sous. Say you so, sir. I'll take your advice and answer it immediately. 
I think Mr. Toper has given you counsel as nicely as if you had given five guineas for a fee. I'm infinitely obliged to him. Sir William, I kiss your hand. Goodbye, knight. And gentlemen, your most obsequious servant. Exunt severally. Scene two. Careful's house. Ogle looking up at it. Enter the other side, Belmain and Toper. Who the devil is that fellow now? I think in my conscience, this place is become the parade of lovers. What? Don't you know him? Why, it is Ogle the fortune hunter. A fortune hunter? I should sooner have taken him for a sheep stealer. He was an attorney's clerk, but his father dying left him a small estate. He bought out his time and set up for a fortune. There's scarce a matchmaker in the whole town, but has had a fleece at his purse. Nor scarce a great fortune in town, but he'll tell you has received his addresses. In short, he's a medley of fop, fool, and coward. Prithee, let's speak to him. He may divert us a little. With all my heart. Mr. Ogle! Your servant. Ha, Mr. Toper, I kiss your hand. To Belmain. Sir, I'm yours. What makes you sauntering here? In my conscience, I believe you are in love with the great fortune of this house. Why, really, Mr. Toper, to be ingenuous with you, I am and not without some very good grounds neither, I assure you. Belmain, aside. How? This coxcomb encouraged too. Oh, I was in hopes to have wished you joy ere now. I think the last time I saw you, you told me you was to be married to my lady Rich. I did so. But sure, I am the most unlucky fellow living. The poor lady died ere she could have an opportunity of declaring her mind to me. And truly I believe I may, without vanity say, she died for love. What? Did you never speak to her? Never. How? Never speak to her, say you? Why, how the devil did you make love then? By a third person, sir. I beg pardon, sir great persons i remember due court by proxy i had several letters from her mrs couple was intimately acquainted with her you know mrs couple mr toper oh very well matchmaking is her business i'll show you what she used to write to me pulling out a letter here no hold this is from a baronet's lady with whom I had an intrigue. This it... No, uh, this is from a merchant's wife, a city animal that pretends to a nicer taste than those of her level, and would fain have a child with the air of a gentleman. But I begged her pardon. I left her to the brutes of her own corporation, for I will have nothing to do with the body politic. <laughs> ridiculous monster for if you observe sir a tradesman is the most litigious cuckold living he never considers the honour a gentleman does him but values himself upon his charter and moves for costs and damages when he ought rather to be thankful for the favour you are very severe upon the city, sir, but where are the letters you was about to show us? Ha! Upon my life, gentlemen, I put em into my scrutor this morning. But, as I was saying, Mrs. Couple had a hundred guineas of me for the management of that business. And if the lady had not died, I'm certain she had been my wife. Well i shall never forget what languishing looks she cast at me at church then put up her fan to her face and sigh as much as to say 
you are the only man that can make me happy. <laughs> Extraordinary symptoms. Faith, t'was very unlucky that you could not come to the speech of her. Was my ill fortune, but I am so used to disappointments that I bear them the easier. What I have met with would have broke the heart of some men. The lady wealthy was perfectly forced for me by her uncle, else I am convinced she had now called me husband. Why? What hopes had you of her? Hopes? Why, the greatest in the world. She praised me to everybody she thought knew me. She said I had the handsomest foot and leg she ever saw, the best manner of dressing, and the genteelest carriage. She said she could hardly believe me an Englishman without doing violence to her reason. Belmaine aside. I should be glad that every English-born blockhead would disclaim his country. Truly, sir, I'm partly of the lady's opinion. Sir, you're a very humble servant. But, sir, was you not saying you had some reason to walk before this house? I was so, sir. Do you know Mr. Careful's daughter, sir? Oh, very well, sir, though I believe not so well as she desires, and I hope to do in a little time. Say you so, sir. Then you are very well acquainted, sir. Yes, very well acquainted, sir. Pray, sir, can you introduce me? Faith, sir, not very well, for I never spoke to the lady in my life how never spoke to her why i understood you that you was well acquainted sir <laughs> why so i am sir why is it not possible to be acquainted without speaking gentlemen why a friend of mine lay all night with a lady and never saw her face nor knows not who she is to this moment now I think seeing is of greater consequence than speaking. But you shall hear how far I am acquainted with this lady. I lodge at her milliner's, you must know, and I have several times passed through the shop when she's been in it. And as soon as my back has been turned, she has always taken an occasion to commend me and say something extraordinary in my praise, which my landlady never failed to tell me, with such an air as if she was desired to tell me, that if she sees me walking here, as I generally do every morning, the straight repairs to the window, thus do you see, stands you there. Now suppose me the lady, you look up at my window, and walk thus, do you see? Then I run to the window, thus, clap my hands across, thus, and hang my head, thus, turn my eyes, languishing, thus, as who should say, if it were the custom for women to make the first addresses, I would now beckon you up. And is this all the hopes you have? Why, is this nothing, gentlemen? Nothing at all. And six to four, the lady never thinks on you. Not think on me? Egad, if she don't marry me, that's the arrentest jilt in Christendom. How jilt? Jilt? I jilt? Why, what the devil need she have made any inquiry after me, praised or looked at me, if she would not have me? Why did she give me encouragement? <laughs> Must a woman be obliged to marry every man she looks at? I am not every man, gentlemen. Egad, I'm resolved all right to her. I'll know what she means by her insinuating carriage. I'll to the rose and write my letter. 
if you'll go with me, gentlemen, you shall see what answer she'll send to me. Hey, Gad, I'm resolved to have good diversion with this fellow. Prithee, Captain, will you go with us? I must pay a visit to an old mistress of mine that lodges hard by, but I'll come to you. To be jilted, egad, I can't bear the thoughts on it. Come, gentlemen. The scene changes to Mrs. Plotwell's lodgings. Mrs. Plotwell, sola. I grow weary of persecuting these blockheads. The very idea of a gallant is nauseous to me. Oh, that all women would but treat the fools as they deserve. Would they take my advice? No fop whose impertinence tended to the prejudice of virtue should escape unexposed. There are different turns of vice I show, that this censorious town might know the greatest monster in the world is a bow. Enter Belmain. The vanity of fops you say you'd show, that all intriguing bells might know there's danger in a noisy bow. <laughs> Who's this that echoes my sound so justly, yet so much inverts the sense? One that admits no pains to invert as many of your sex as he can. A true tried old friend to love. Embracing her. <laughs> Captain Balmain. My charming Plotwell, as blooming, young, and fair as ever, as beautiful as martyrs of visions, and full of pleasure and delight as dreams of longing boys. Oh, Lord, give me breath. Let me have a little air, or I shall die. So, well, where have you been all this while? And how have you spent your time? Lord, I think I have a thousand questions to ask in one breath. And I have as many to ask you, but can't spare time now. Some more pressing private business would take me wholly up, fitter for the next room. Shall we retire? Pulling her. No, stand off. If we retire, it must be upon conditions agreed to beforehand. With all my heart, child, I was never better conditioned for a lady's service in all my life looky here here are conditions shows a purse of gold observe the conditions and let's be happy though i never thought you missionary till now i'm not so much displeased with your mistaking me as i should be with any one else for besides some allowance for your humour your absence from town so long may excuse you from the knowledge of my present principles and designs and as great a libertine as you profess yourself i know the awful lustre of virtue has always met with due respect from you and that respect is the only condition i require you to observe ha he why what the devil is here my old mistress setting up for virtue for heaven's sake what do you mean madam as i say sir that i am no more what you once knew me since your abode in ireland my uncle who kept me from my estate is dead thank heaven and i am now mistress of a fortune sufficient for my use and had i possessed it sooner i never had been what i was but now i scorn mankind on terms like those all innocent diversions i freely take i keep the best company pay and receive visits from the highest quality people who are better bred than to examine into past conduct hey i find then that reputation is never lost but in an empty pocket well then thou'st grown virtuous and i must never hope for the blessing again never but talk as free as you will do but observe the rules of modesty i like your company and conversation as well as ever i am not so rigidly virtuous to appear saint i can launch out and laugh with you sometimes nay perhaps contribute to your mirth i'll give you a short account how i have passed my time in exposing to public view all the follies of your sex that part of them i mean whose vanity brought them under my lash 
such whose tiffany natures are so easily imposed upon to have the commonest drabs in town topped upon them for women of quality this town does abound with such as you speak of oh did you but see with what variety it is furnished and how universally all men are infected with an itch after quality you'd be convinced there's not one from the gentleman of the bedchamber down to the groom in the stable but thinks himself sufficiently qualified to deserve the favour of any lady in st james's i passed upon one for a countess upon another for a duchess another a baronet's lady and so forth <laughs> the poor fools were lost in a cloud of ignorance raised by the hurry of their own expectations why truly it would surprise a man that never conversed with aunt above a pit mask to be invited to a lady's bed <laughs> such awkward address and the means every man finds to recommend himself by one for secrecy the other wit a third his person so every fool finds something to think valuable in himself there's your weekly finicking dancing singing woody fop who values himself upon writing billet d'eau and thinks his company so very agreeable that he persecutes people to death before they can get rid of his troublesome impertinence his chiefest talent conflicts in the repartee of an intrigue but then there's your old hardened sinner ay he cries up secrecy and security his years wrinkles and distorted body are sufficient defence against the slanderous tongue he values himself more for what he has been than for what he is recommending himself upon his knowledge and experience and his great judgment in the happy management of an intrigue but the man of sense him all women ought to shun that fear coming under his power he approaches securely addresses cunningly insinuates himself slyly into a lady's favour then seizes his prey at once embracing her oh lord hold off enter plotwell's maid and whispers her belmain aside fox take her for coming so unluckily this denial of hers gives me as much desire as a new face that she should grow so unfeasonably virtuous well madam you have business i see i'll take my leave some other time i'll hear it out my business at present is for the good of your friend manley and i don't know but we may have occasion for your head to help us out my head together with the rest of my body is at your service madam whenever you please to command your humble servant exit clarinda desires to speak with me at her father's house say you yes madam instantly i'll wait on her scene changes to a tavern toper and ogle sealing a letter here porter carry this letter as tis directed and bring me an answer yes sir sir william mode within here drawer show a room and send your master to me toper aside ah that's mode's voice a good hint i'll have rare sport with these two puppies i think i heard sir william mode's voice prithee toper desire him to walk in not for the world no why pray i know not but somebody has told him that you are his rival and he swears he'll cut your throat wherever he sees you how i his rival where pray you in clarinda i suppose but is it possible sir william mode should be my rival and never tell me on it but he's such an egregious coxcomb that he gives me no pain he called you um, fop blockhead uh, baboon and said he'd make mincemeat of you oh impossible sir 
You could not mean me. Do you think I lie, sir? Oh, by no means, sir. Had any man said so much of me, I would have made the sun shine through him. And I think you ought to send him a challenge. What challenge, my friend? By no means, sir. Why, sir, he is my friend. So much the worse. You ought to resent an affront from him the more for that. Oh, sir, you don't know us. We never mind what we say of one another. I dare swear he never meant it an affront. You lie, sir. He did mean it an affront. Sir, I heartily beg your pardon. I believe he did because you say it. Sir, else I should not believe it. Sir, I say you must fight him, and I'll carry the challenge. That's a sure way that I'll challenge him. But how to come off as sure? Hang me if I know. Look you, Mr. Toper. I have not the ready use of both my legs, for, dancing at a private ball the other night, I cut something higher than usually, and pitched upon a cherry stone, which turned my foot so violently that I vow I have been lame ever since, so that positively I can't fight. Zones, I believe you dare not fight him. Pardon me, sir. I dare fight any man that will but give me time to prepare myself for a duel, for I think there should be a diet used for fighting as well as running. <laughs> well, I find what you hint at. I'll engage to bring you off safe. As how, pray? Why, as thus. Do you challenge him? And when you meet, draw your sword. But suppose he draws again? Then I'll step in and part you. So you are good friends. Toper, aside. For I don't design you shall fight in earnest. A very good project. Come, come. Write three words to him upon this paper. But you'll be sure to part us? Ay, certainly. Ogle writes. Now I wish Belmain was here to share the diversion. There, sir, there's enough. Hmm, let me see. Sir, you must resign all pretensions to Clarinda, or fight me immediately. I wait in the next room for your answer. Ogle. So, very well. Do you stay here? I'll be back in a minute. Scene changes to another room in the same house. Sir William and the Tavern Man. His hermitage is not brisk. Upon my word, Sir William, there's no better in London. It is not so good as the last you sent me. It is the very same, sir. Well, send me in four dozen. How much champagne, Sir William? Four dozen of that, too. And four of the burgundy. You shall have it, sir. Exit. Enter Toper. Sir William, I'm your humble servant. Mr. Toper, your servant? Pray, how did you know I was here? I'm not usually found in a tavern. I heard your voice, Sir William. Just as you entered, I was engaged in a quarrel of yours. Of mine? Aye. Sir William, tis a damn foolish business. I would have made it up, but I found it impossible, so that, being your friend, I undertook to deliver you this. Gives him the letter. How's this? A challenge from Ogle? Certainly the fellow's drunk, or he'd never do this. No, that he is not, I'll promise you. He's sober enough. But in a damned passion. He says you're a fop, fool, nay, coward. If I might advise you, you should fight him instantly. Sir Death, 
were i in your place sir william such a dog should not dare to look nay think of a woman i design to marry sir william aside i hate fighting but i dare not tell this blustering fellow so nay i know he's a blockhead and a coward too but what carriage love may have infused into him i know not why what the devil he said not a word of his passion to me yesterday he dined with me he did not know it then but now he swears he'll spoil your handsome face O oh, lord i'd rather be run through the body and feeble me in my soul i wonder what makes men so stout i'll tell you sir william courage is nothing nothing at all now if you look big talk loud and be very angry you'll frighten a man that can't do so well as you so you are reckoned a stout man and he that can do it better is a stouter man than you that's all is that all why then i'm resolved to be stout and feeble me but suppose he should draw why then i'll step in and part you a very good piece of contrivance pay my figure be sure you get the first word for there's advantage in having the first word enter drawer did you call gentlemen ay is mr ogle below yes sir hold i'll fetch him myself exit now i am confoundedly afraid lest this fellow should let us fight in earnest re-enter toper and ogle to whom he speaks at entering be sure you speak angrily as if you would not hear what i say be sure you part us then sir i say i will hear of no reconciliation except he resign corinda toper runs to sir william he's in a damned passion your hand to your sword quickly sir william fear nothing i'll stand by you as soon as they see one another they run and embrace mr ogle sir william dear mr ogle i'm glad to see you zounds i have taken all this pains for this harky sir william damn you draw upon him or i'll draw upon you do you hear no reply but draw do you hear oh heaven i must draw in my own defence and i'm sure there's less danger in ogle than in this fellow draws i think mr ogle you sent me a challenge just now by mr taper and having paid the ceremony due to friends and acquaintance you must draw so and return my compliment aside i'll be sure to have somebody to part us though runs and knocks at the door with his foot harky ogle you have ruined yourself by letting him get the advantage draw draw sir draw sir why sir my passion was over upon my faith oh here's folks now i am resolved to draw now draws enter two drawers one runs to sir william to other to ogle and holds him oh stand off i'd rather be run through the guts than you should touch me with your dirty apron to dauble my clothes off scoundrel toper holds ogle let him come let him come one thrust will decide our dispute pray give us way it will soon be ended enter belmain hey day you what's here swords drawn nay then i'll make one in the number draws why what the devil do you hold the gentleman for let him go and give one another satisfaction to death i'll fight that man that shall but offer to hold him takes off the drawers and toper why don't you fight now gentlemen a box taken for his brutish civility when they are at liberty they stand and look at one another sir william goes to ogle and speaks in a low voice harkee mr ogle 
Do you come along with me and we'll contrive some way to make these fellows believe we dare fight. Agreed. Come, Mr. Ogle, you shall go along with me. We will find a more convenient place to decide this business in where friends shall not interrupt. You shall hear of a duel, gentlemen, though it is not proper to see it. Your humble servant. Exit. With all my heart, I dare fight you anywhere. That's a lie. Prithee, order thy footman to watch him. I fancy they'll have some comical stratagem to deceive us. <laughs> With all my heart, Dyer here, be sure you take notice where they go and bring me word. Exit servant. Prithee, how didst work him up to this? With a world of pains and difficulty, I assure you. But there is no fear of their doing one another any harm in a fighting way. Is not that Colonel Manley yonder? Tis, and I have some business with him. Will you walk? My business at present lies another way. Else I'd be glad to drink a bottle with him. For though we roar and rake and broils commence, yet give me for a friend a man of sense. The End of the Second Act Act Three of The Bow's Duel or a Soldier for the Ladies by Susanna Sentliver. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Scene Careful's House. Careful Solace with Ogle's Letter. Very fine. I see my daughter is resolved to have strings and out her bow. Death to give encouragement to a dog that has neither wit nor money to recommend him. A good Mr. Ogle, if I catch you ogling there, I'll hamstring you. I can tell you that for your comfort. I'm glad I got the letter before her. My spark's very familiar, methinks. Reads. Madame, I informed you entertain Sir William Mode. If so, I desire to know the reason why you encourage me. I am not to be fooled. Who the devil is this coxcomb? If you clear not this imputation, I shall believe you design to jilt me. Very complacent, truly. And Sir Perbera, as you value your admirer, Ogle. Yes, I have answered Perbera with a broken pate, and I of yours had been in his place. Lord, Lord, who would be plagued with children? I am resolved she shall marry Sir William to-morrow. Why, she'll have as many fellows at her heels as her colonel has soldiers waiting for their pay. Why, what a medley of suitors has she? Fighters, fools, and fops. Well, since you are so fickle, mistress, I'll fix you presently, or marry myself. Mr. Toper was wishing me to a cousin of his. He will be in town to-day. At odd, if this perverse baggage make one scruple of obeying my will, I'll have her, and try if her mother-in-law won't hamper her, but I'll in, and send for Sir William immediately. Exit. The scene changes to another room in the same house. Clorinda and Amelia, dressing in boys' clothes, Mrs. Plotwell with them. Here, here, on with your manhood, quickly! I fear, Clorinda, this masquerade will not be reputable for women of nice honor. Oh, don't fear that, since you only wear it to do yourselves justice. For justice can never be dishonorable. You are not insensible, cousin, how resolutely my cruel father persecutes me with this fop. Therefore, since poor Clorinda is in all this danger, I, my own knight-errant, and thou, my trusty squire, will march all cavalier and deliver the distressed damsel by beating the giant into a pygmy. Then be our own heralds and proclaim our victory to my father, and hollow the coward so loud in his ears that we will shame him out of all thoughts of this fool. If that don't do it, my plot shall. Topa has broke it to him, as I told you. I readily submit to any proposal of yours, and will rely on your contrivance. You may command me, but be quick and dress. Who told you of this duel? 
Sir William's valet makes love to my woman. Through him we discover the time and place. But I know not the grounds of this quarrel. That, I suppose, is your ladyship. For Mr. Ogle publicly declares you are in love with him. Ogle? Who is he? A foolish fellow about town. He lodges at Mrs. Commode's, your milliner. Oh, heavens! I believe I've seen him pass through the shop but never had curiosity enough to ask his name in love with him i should as soon be in love with a weasel <laughs> why is he sir william's antagonist i fancy we shall have rare sport they are as like two peas in everything but estate and in that sir william outdoes him he is the very quintessence of foppery his name and nature suits exactly for he's a nice observer of the modes his valet is forced to counterfeit a frenchman or he would turn him away <laughs> ridiculous enough well thus dressed now what are we to do why when we're sated with their sordid foppery we'll kick them into better manners how kick clorinda if they should return our compliment i shall quickly discover my manhood to be counterfeit never fear it they won't fight with a mouse i dare swear if it were out of a trap i know sir william's a coward i'd been often told so and to prove it i sent him a challenge as from one mr roughly his man said it put him in such a consternation he should never forget him he sent me word that he'd meet me at the calais sands and give me satisfaction <laughs> a good excuse indeed he is fit for nothing but to set upon one's cabinet to watch one's china well i wish you good sport and am your humble servant exit mrs plotwell i'm resolved ere i'll be forced into the arms of a person i loathe and despise the passion i have for colonel manley will tempt me to make him my sanctuary amelia aside i must tell her of his falsehood the thoughts of which have turned all the foolish passion i had conceived take care clorinda you bent deceived in him what do you mean amelia that he is false false impossible how do you know this i have the best proof in the world of it ocular demonstration he makes love to me nay don't start had i not been too much your friend clorinda i had not let you into the secret for upon my word i don't think him disagreeable clorinda aside oh heavens she's in love with him and therefore would slyly persuade me into an ill opinion of him how know you tis he cousin i am sure that gentleman that bowed us into the side-box the first night i came to town has ever since pursued me with most violent love and i must confess i liked his humour so well that i could not be displeased with his playing the fool where did you see him next how got he an opportunity you know the next night i went out with only my woman i remember why then i went to the play in a mask on purpose for a little diversion and twas my fortune to sit next to him in the pit where during the playtime he entertained me with the prettiest discourse in the world and when twas done he would not part with me till i had promised to write him and i could not help keeping my word if i was to be hanged but finding him false to you i hate him this letter i have writ to upbraid him shows a letter how's this for mr celadon ay we pass upon one another for celadon and chloe for my part i did not inquire his name because he should not ask mine did he ever ask your name nor tell you his no and i suppose that was his policy to prevent a discovery to you enter clorinda's maid giving her a letter ah oh, tis from manly what's this reads hmm. the private encouragement you give that fop sir william is not so closely managed to escape a jealous lover's eye that sees you everywhere to be deceived touches my tenderest part especially from one i thought my own but we are subject to mistakes 
i find that i am so in you my eyes my ears are all witnesses i shall take what care i can not to be troublesome to you since i find you no longer value the peace of manly oh monstrous perfidious mankind oh i perceive your drift he charges me with this fool on purpose to find pretense for his own falsehood it is a poor excuse but what won't men fall into when they quit their honour oh that i had but an opportunity of unbraiding him to his face that you shall he knows not yet of the discovery i'll write to him to come here i have no reason to suspect his disobeying the summons no more now than formerly did he use to meet you then most punctually but i'll in and write to him and be here in a minute exit well it is impossible to dive into the heart of man for sure he has the face of truth nay i can hardly believe he's false yet so deep an impression did his seeming honesty stamp upon my soul re-enter amelia i have sent it away and i doubt not but to convince you of the truth of what i say but come don't think on it now but let's be gone methinks i long to bully these cowards pray heaven they prove so do sonnet this will destroy half the satisfaction i promised myself from this frolic but come if we succeed in proteus's artful school the world shall say a very bow's a fool exit scene hyde park enter sir william and ogle with files pumps and nightcaps Mere's a weapon mr ogle will decide the quarrel as well as e'er a sharp and christened to men without danger and admirable contrivance sir william for now they'll hear of a duel and we reckoned such skilful artists that neither could overcome right i think a gentleman ought to wear a sharp for a terror to the vulgar and because tis the fashion but he should never use it but as an ornament and part of his dress i hope to see it as much a fashion to fight with files as just to fence with them if i was a member of parliament i'd bring in a bill against duelling i'm sure the clause would pass for the majority in the house of my constitution come approach so far enter clorinda and amelia with their swords drawn hold gentlemen i'm bound in honour to part you ha! what's this files upon my honour <laughs> why do you laugh gentlemen i think this is the nicest way of deciding a quarrel the other is fit for not but bullies and soldiers to get their bread by it tis easily seen this way who is the most skilled and pray what is got by the other more rude method but a scandalous character or a shameful death and by my consent he that draws a sword out of the immediate service of the king should be hanged say you so sir now hear my sentiments he that would not draw a sword upon any just account should be kicked thus uh, and thus mm, sir kicks him what do you mean gentlemen only to rub your courage a little what's that sir you don't hear well sir i'll lengthen your ears a little pulls him by the ears i wonder that you who look so like a gentleman should be guilty of such ill-bred actions fie kick and cough exercises for footmen pray learn better carriage of us i'd as soon learn manners of a muscovite pray sir who are you and what affairs led you hither i'm a servant to clorinda and consequently a rival of yours ogle aside oh lord a rival of mine too i came hither to kick you and expose you when i had done the first you are sensible i have performed and from that instance of my honesty you may take my word for the rest sir william aside i am undone blister me the very shadow of a jewel be not unfortunate 
Enter Colonel Manley and Captain Belmain. Why, how now, young gentlemen? Are you breathing yourselves or giving lessons in the Stoic philosophy to those patient disciples? Or have you a journey to ride that you are getting your backside hardened for it? Sir William aside. Manly here, I'd compound for half my estate, blister me. Ha! Manly here. We must retire, cousin, lest it spoils our plot, as doubtless it will if he knows us. Methinks I could even here reproach him. Exit Clorinda and Amelia. This is hearing of a duel. Indeed, files. Ha ha ha. You was resolved to prevent murder. You need never fear the exaltation of the gallows, for your courage reaches but to a chance medley at most. Prithee, who are those gentlemen, Sir William? Methinks they used you very familiarly. Men of no honour, you may conclude, Colonel, else they would not have affronted gentlemen when they found them defenceless. Right. But why would you be so defenceless? Faith, Sir William, if this news reaches your mistress's ears, it will ruin you in her favour. Take this for a rule. The less regard you have for your honour, the more you sink in esteem with your mistress. For all women hate a coward. You ought to be forbid the habits of men who can be guilty of effeminacy that even women would blush at well gentlemen i think passivel sits well enough upon men that have estates and have a mind to live and enjoy them damn him for a cowardly blockhead prithee let's go i am sick of their folly besides you said you would convince me of clorinda's falsehood Enter Belmain's man, and gives him a letter. I have run, sir, all the way, for the porter told me it must be giving you that moment. Ha! That's a lucky hit, Colonel. She invites me to come to her lodging, and her servant should be ready to convey me into her apartment. Here, read it, man. Now you may convince yourself. Egad, if I were not a damned honest fellow to my friend now could i pass three hours the most agreeable in the world pox on me for a prating coxcomb could not i have held my tongue well what think you of it colonel it is not her hand but that's nothing she might disguise that to conceal it from me i know not what to think but i am resolved to go and if I find her false, twill cure me effectually. Come on, then. Exit. I have been considering all this while upon what the colonel said, and I am resolved to be valiant, for if ladies don't like a coward, I shall never get a fortune, for aught I know, I may fight as well as anybody. I'm resolved to try. Hark ye, Sir William, our servants are hereby. Let's send for our swords and fight in earnest. Not I, Mr. Ogle. I declare against fighting positively. But I declare for fighting, and so shall you, or resign all pretensions to Clorinda, for I design to marry her myself. Therefore don't think of her, do you hear? You marry her, ha, ha, ha. Sound, sir, dare you laugh at a gentleman, yet dare not fight? Take that, sir. Strikes up his heels. And the next time I hear you speak a word more of her, I'll cut your throat, and so good-bye. So this is one step towards courage. I'm resolved to challenge every man that pretends to a fortune till i have got one myself and now my hand's in i'll challenge this colonel the next time i see him though at the head of his regiment rat this blockhead what a metamorphosis is here 
"'Tis well I fell upon my cloak, or I daubed all of my clothes, blister me. "'Well, to sing, dance, or court a lady, or any such gentleman-like employments, "'I'll turn my back to none. "'But for the slovenly exercise of fighting, "'I shall ne'er be brought to endure it and pair my vigour. Exit. Scene, Careful's house. Careful pulling in Amelia in boy's clothes. Who the devil have we here? Nay, nay, sir, I must see your face. Another gallant of my daughter's, I warrant. Who are you, sir? From whence come you? What business have you in my house, ha? Huh? Oh, Lord, what shall I say to this old fellow? He'll certainly know me. What are you studying for a lie, sir? Adored, I shall make you find your tongue. Speak quickly, or I'll cut your throat, you dog, you. Draws. Ah! Oh, Lord! A sword! For heaven's sake, sir! Oh, Lord, sir! Don't you know me? Know you, sir? Who the pox are you, sir? Ha! Amelia? Why, what masquerade's this? Where's my daughter? Enter Clorinda. Ho, oh, sir, your humble servant. Why, what a pox are you going into the service? You are too pretty, volunteers, Faith. Ha! Oh, my father! What shall I say? I'll e'en face it out since he has catched me. We have done a friend of yours some service, sir. A friend of mine? As how, pray, forsooth? Why, you must know, sir. I was informed of a duel between Sir William Bode and a brother beau of his. The concern I knew you had for Sir William's safety engaged my care and prevention. I was unwilling to expose him by fending anybody else, so that my cousin and I, by the help of this disguise, parted them. But we should not need to have made such haste, for the puppies were trying their valour safely with a couple of files. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. And this was the occasion of your being in breeches, ha? Huh? And I think it a good project, too, uncle. You do. Well, daughter, pray let's have you in your feminine capacity again. For though you bully in breeches, I hope you'll marry in petticoats. Marry, sir? Yes, forsooth. I've sent for Sir William in order to have the settlement completed to-night, and to-morrow your honour shall rise with the sun. That is to say, you shall be my lady mode. Honour? Sir? Where is the honour in such a husband? I hope, sir, you will not marry me to a coward. Why, there's not a needy bully around town but will beat a maintenance out of him. And where is the reputation in such a marriage? But he'll make a swinging jointure. And if you don't like him, when you have him, you may live apart. Oh, heaven! What shall I say? Sir, I beg you'll delay your purpose for a month. Not for a day. Sir, I have sworn not to marry this month. Have you so? Pray, who have you sworn to, mistress? To Mr. Ogle, ha? Huh? Ogle? Who was he, pray, sir? Heaven, has my father got this story too? You don't know such a person? I'll warrant you as Mr. Ogle? I have seen such a fellow, sir, but never spoke to him. No. Look in my face. You never spoke to him? That is, encouraged his love? No, upon my honour. You lie. You have no honour. Read that. Throws the letter. And do you hear? Resolve to marry Sir William tomorrow by six, or I'll marry myself before twelve. So take your choice. I'll ogle you, and sold you with a pox to you. Exit. Oh, the impudence of Ogle. I'll have the rascal toffed in a blanket. See, Amelia, what an audacious letter tis. Bless me. I have no patience. I encourage such a rascal. He is very familiar, methinks. Hang him. The fool's below your anger. Never think on it. Come, prithee think which way to turn yourself if the colonel be false, as I dare swear he is. What think you of marrying Sir William? He is master of a fair estate, which you may make subservient to your pleasures, to make life's rugged journey pass the smoother. If he be true, as you have but little reason to think he is, you may yet find some way to accomplish your desires. Come, the time draws on, in which you'll be convinced of this truth or falsehood. Come what will, 
resolve to be content and trust to fortune for the wished event. Exit. Enter careful Toper and Mrs. Plotwell, dressed like a Quaker. Mr. Toper, your cousin is welcome. My house is at your service, madame. I thank thee, but pray thee do not madam me. My name is Anne. A very handsome woman, and very modestly dressed. I have used all the arguments in my power to convert her from this formality, but in vain. She's as averse to the fashions as other women are fond of em. But I hope your niece and daughter will work a reformation in her. I rather hope she'll work one in them. I'll assure you I'll recommend her as a pattern. Is this the woman you would recommend to me for a wife, Mr. Topol? The same, sir. I protest I like her exceedingly. She seems cut out on purpose for me. Her plain way of living will improve my estate, and her morals will hamper my daughter. I like a religious woman. You can't be better matched if she has not too much. Yesterday I carried her to wait on a relation of ours that has a parrot, and whilst I was discoursing about some private business, she converted the bird, and now it talks of nothing but the light of the spirit and the inward man. <laughs> good luck, good luck. Well, well, thee wilt never leave thy ridiculous jests. I say that mankind were not made for foppery and pride, but to do good in their generation. Prithee, show me one text of scripture for the fashions, or where jewels are commanded, or what holy matron ever had a valet to dress them, as they say the French ladies have. Oh, monstrous fashion! No, no, our devoutest women wore coarse linen, or rather none at all. Ah, such saints as wore their congregations with outside and swarmed with christian vermin it must be them <laughs> but you hold every handsome garment a sin handsome garment verily i believe if we are punished with taxes again to carry on another war twill be a just judgment upon this sinful land for their long wigs hooped coats furbelows false teeth and patches Truly, I am of her opinion. She speaks like an oracle, for the devil was never so proud as our women are nowadays. Aside. I'm resolved, if my daughter shew the least reluctance to my will, to marry her out of hand, I'll motion it to her, and try how she likes me. What think you of a husband, forsooth? For to be plain with you, your extraordinary qualities have raised a great desire in me of becoming such. I doubt, friend. Thou'd expect a larger fortune than I am dame of. I protest, I don't care if you have not a groat. Your virtue is a wealthy dowry to me. Say you'll but have me, and tis enough. But it may be thou'lt be against my course of life. I love retirement, must have time for my devotion in my own way. I'm not used to the ceremony of visits, and hate tea-table vanity and card-play, as they call it our plot takes rarely this makes me love you more one thing more thou hast a daughter they say a topping gallant which i desire to see and try if good admonitions together with example won't reform her for plainly i don't care to come under the roof where children are if they be not dutiful so i must see her first ere i can give thee my answer that you shall presently here carry this gentlewoman to my daughter and tell her she must entertain her as her mother that is to be tell her so from me do you hear exit mrs plotwell and servant really mr topher your cousin is a profound christian if my daughter refuse to marry sir william i'll jointure her in my whole estate well, for aught I know, you can't do better than marry. For who would be plagued with a disobedient child? Especially when they depend upon us for their fortunes. The devil young fellow would care a souse for their persons, did not our purse-strings draw. 
here forsooth my daughter is running mad after a soldier a fellow whose fortune depends upon his sword and here we're going to wars again and fix the fall but a cannon bullet takes his head off and then the wife is turned home to her father again and in such cases a father has never disposed of his children entirely and all the jointures she'll bring will consist of housings holster caps pistols swords and so forth enter servant is sir william mode below sir tell him i'll wait on him presently come mr topher you shall be witness of our agreement i sent for him to complete the business sign seal to-night and to-morrow we'll have a dance exit i fancy we shall drive dancing out of your head old gentleman exit end of the third act Act Four of The Bow's Duel or a Soldier for the Ladies by Susanna Sentliver. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One. Enter Clorinda, Amelia, and Mrs. Plotwell. Well, in my conscience, the first sight of you frightened me horribly though i knew your plot i vow you make a sanctified figure might i pass upon the brethren think you ay and hold forth too i'll warrant you without being discovered but is my uncle so hot upon matrimony say you as a hound upon the scent though he'll share no more of the pleasure than the dog of the game he runs down <laughs> i vow i can't help laughing to think of what a trick we shall play upon him but the deuce on it i cannot be heartily merry till i see the event of this meeting i long till the colonel comes so do i as much as you to upbraid him with his treachery enter maid and whispers them in my conscience he's here show him into my chamber tell him i'll wait on him presently now clorinda you shall go in my place heavens oh how i tremble oh the perfidious wretch sure he's quite lost of virtue that he dares thus impudently venture into the very house oh give me patience heaven and power to back my resolution and scorn enough to show my deep resentment exit clorinda i'll to the old man and keep him in discourse that he mayn't interrupt you exit do so i must listen a little to hear what reception she gives him exit enter colonel manley solus this love makes men the errantest asses in the world what blustering mars with all his steely garniture of war could never do this blind boy does with a feathered reed oh my soul i think i'm grown a coward and begin to fear my heart beats faster than a raw soldier's in his first engagement or a longing maid in the arms of a man she likes when opportunity creates her fears sure it cannot be clorinda enter clorinda colonel manley aside ha by heaven the very crocodile clorinda aside by all my hopes of happiness the very monster madam you are surprised i believe not to meet the man you expected i beg your pardon for this disappointment oh indignation no sir i have but the man i expected though you are disappointed in your woman what does she mean have you a stratagem madam to bring you off come i'll help you say you happened into this room by chance and had no knowledge of the plot expected no gallant oh unheard of impudence a gallant no thou monster of ingratitude have i refused all mankind for thee nay broke in upon the rules of my obedience that i might keep my faith inviolate and am i thus rewarded 
Is it not enough that you are false and that I see you of? But you must add to your barbarity and throw a scandal on my fame to hide your base proceeding. Marry thee? No. From this moment I resolve to hate and to put it out of thy power ever to deceive me a second time. I'll marry instantly. Belmain peeping. I must hear how the colonel succeeds in my place. It is enough I know thee guilty of that very crime thou wouldst impose on me. Know that you writ to my friend to come here, with whom you have had many private conferences, though I, heaven knows, would not believe it till my eyes convinced me. But now thy crimes are obvious to my sight and I take thee at thy word, and from this moment I'll never see you more. Confusion on your sex. Exit. Ha! Huh, his friend! What can he mean? Sure there's some mistake in this, yet I cannot call him back. Enter Amelia pulling in Belmain. What have we, eavesdroppers? Oh, heavens! Why, was not you with my cousin? Hey, day, why was not you with the colonel? Why are you not the colonel? No, Faith, and now I must begin to suspect you are not Clarinda. You are in the right, indeed. I am not. Oh, heavens! I'm undone! Manly's innocent! <laughs> no, no, madam. I'll call my friend back immediately. He shall beg pardon upon the spot. Why, what a damned mistake is here. Faith, he's gone, but here's an old gentleman coming up. Goes to the door and returns quickly. Oh, Lord, my father, I'm undone if he finds a man here. What shall I do? This was your project, Amelia. Ha, Zedeth, madam, where shall I run? For methinks I would not do any more mischief. What shall I do, ladies? Ha! A lucky thought comes into my head. Here, here, here! Lie down upon this mat. With all my heart, pox on it, to be thus put to it for nothing. If I had but got a maiden head, or made a cuckold, it would not have vexed me. Lies down, and they roll him up. Enter careful, and tumbles over the mat. There, there! Lie still! A pox on your pride! You must have mats with a vengeance. But I'll turn over a new leaf with this house. I'll warrant you, I'll have no mats, but such as lie under the feather beds. Here, I might have broke my neck. Enter Toby. Sirrah, remove that mat, and do you hear? Throw it into the horse pond. I'll have no more mats in my house. Mat? Tis damn heavy. Come out here. I believe the dog's got into it. Clorinda aside. Oh, Lord, what shall I do? The man goes to take up the mat and finds it heavy, shakes it, and out drops Belmain. The horse pond. Nay, then, tis time to shift for myself. Here, here. Runs to Toby. There's a guinea for you, Toby. Bring him off some way or other. Ha, huh, what was that? Bark, sir, bark. Only the great dog, sir, was crept in the man. Woof, 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 woof. Creeps off quick. Rarely done. Expect a better reward for this, Toby. The dog, was it? I protest I thought it had been a thief. No, sir, nothing else. Exit with the mat. Why, how now? He thinks you are mightily prinked up. Mercy upon me. What a bush of hair is there, first out. In my conscience, I believe you have got the foretop of some beau's wig. That's the fashion, uncle. You would not have a dress like my quaking aunt that is to be. <laughs> How now, sauce box? Your quaking aunt, quotha. Sir, I hope you don't design to marry that thing. Thing, do you call her? I cod you shall marry Sir William immediately, or call that thing mother. I can tell you that. Oh, heavens, what shall I do? Enter Sir William and Mrs. Plotwell. Here, Sir William, I give her to your arms. 
I'll have my coach harnessed and to church this moment. Madam, though I don't pretend to be a beau, yet I hope the world will distinguish the difference between a rough, unhewn soldier and a polished gentleman. I don't in the least hint at manly. Clorinda aside. Insipid, coxcomb. Amelia to Plotwell. For heaven's sake, invent some way to give her an hour's time to consider, or she's undone. Friend, shall I speak one word with thee? Twenty, if you please. Let me advise thee. Do not be so passionate with thy daughter. The little discourse I had with her showed her to be tractable. If thou think'st fit, I'll read her the other lesson upon her duty, and I don't doubt but she'll comply. With all my heart, for whatever thou sayest must be for her good, I'm convinced. Sir William, we'll go take a glass in the next room till the bride be ready, and then— And then, madam, I shall be the happiest man alive. If I will change conditions with the Tsar of Muscovy, may I be condemned to the smoke of tobacco and never know the pleasure of taking snuff. Exit. A very courtly wish indeed. Come, don't trifle away the time I have given you, but write to Manly and beg him to protect you and rescue you from the arms of this fool. Oh, how can I write to him whom I have abused? And did he not pay you in the same coin? Come, come, this little mistake rather serves to increase his love than diminish it. When he finds you true, as no doubt but Balmain has told him ere this, he'll be glad to accept the conditions. Come, come, write to him. Topa is within, and he shall carry it. Well, it being my last shift, I'll follow your advice. Exit. I, I do so. I'll warrant you a fortune and the old man's consent before I have done with him. <laughs> a drum beating up for volunteers. Belmain crosses the stage and a sergeant after him. Captain! Captain! Ha! Sergeant! I have got the finest volunteer. A bow, Captain. A bow? Nay, if the bows begin to list, let the French look to it. Where is he, Sergeant? He's coming now, sir. I can't stay now, but I'll be here in a moment, and I'll bring the colonel with me. I'll wait on you, sir. Exit. Enter Ogle. The captain will be here in a moment, sir. But, pray, sir, why will you go for a soldier? Methinks you might get a commission. Because I dreamt, sir, I should be a general, and I have a mind to rise gradually. I hate jumping into honor at once. Sir, I honor you. No doubt but your dream will come true. Sir, I dreamt last night that I saw two armies join battle, and, methought, in the scuffle, my brains were knocked out, and when I waked, I wondered to find myself with all my limbs. I straight felt for my other leg and suspected my eyes when they informed me I had both hands. A very good dream, sir, and signifies your advancement. Nay, after that, I had the strangest dream. My man found me scaling my curtains for a fort, killing my pillow, and entering duel with my breeches. Methought, all the Trojan faces in the hanging were turned Frenchmen, and a famine raging amongst them. They resolved to eat me, so casting dice what part of me to devour first. The lot fell upon my head. Now, sir, all these dreams I interpret quite contrary. I know I shall be a great man. No doubt on it, sir. Aside, I'm afraid all this fellow's courage lies in his sleep. I'm resolved to sound him a little. Prithee, sergeant, tell me what sort of a thing a camp is. Why, truly, sir, a camp would be a pleasant place, did the fields produce feather beds, 
or if the streams like those of the golden age did run pure wine or if camp meals would every twelve and seven observe due hours but sir to be half starved on scarce fresh green sod just so much earth to earth and then to live the life of nature or as some do call it the life of the hardy to quench one's thirst at the next spring coffin up one's self each night in turf and thence come forth like one of cadmus's soldiers sown with serpent's teeth and start forth armed from a furrow is a course of life i fear will never suit with your constitution tis something hard truly but no matter i'm resolved oh this is nothing sir here comes on a troop and your honour can't but lose an eye an engine there goes off and you will show yourself a coward unless you lose an arm here you are surrounded and then twere base to bring more than one shoulder off ogle rubbing his shoulder aside ha <laughs> ha i don't like it nay sir consider ere you go for tis a damned disgrace to have a nose after a battle or to walk the streets upon your own legs hm. i feel myself already partly composed of flesh partly of wood methinks i hang between two crutches like a man in chains tossed by the wind i don't like this slicing into reputation enter belmaine and colonel manley but these men that you raise sergeant are they to go against the french or spaniards why do you ask sir because i cannot in honour draw my sword against the french how so pray you're no jacobite i hope oh sir my scruples are not founded upon religion but i'll tell you that last long vacation i made the tour of france and lorraine where i received such extraordinary marks of civility particularly from the duke of berry the duke of burgundy and the chevalier de st georges and from the governor of calais such extravagant obligations but above all from the governor's daughter that upon my soul i cannot descend so far from the punctilios of honour to go against em but against spain i ha the colonel i am resolved to fight him however death hell and furies draw sir draw sir for what sir sir i say draw sir or else resign all pretensions to clorinda why what a metamorphosis is here is this your volunteer surgeon yes sir but if you had not come as you did he had been gone for i found his courage began to sink to clorinda how dare such a coxcomb as you name clorinda draws and disarms him now learn more wit or get more courage courage sir sideth sir i'll box with you pulling off his neckcloth you've got my sword but no matter for that i'll fight it out at fists lose a fortune for want of fighting no i'll box with you dog to the sergeant give me the cane sirrah i'll make mummy of your bones i'll make you forswear sauntering after fortunes nay you shall not dare to look towards the house where they live or so much as think of them beats him all this time oh lord sir for heaven's sake sir i'll observe the conditions nay now you are too rigid i dare promise for mr ogle i will indeed sir only let me think of them for who can help thinking sir no here sergeant take this fellow let him run the gantelope i'll think you sirrah oh lord sir spare that and i will not think of em upon my faith sir nay one thing more you must promise which is 
to resume your wanted cowardice and betake you to your desk again. Go, take money of the men you meant to cousin. Talk little, except when you are paid for it. Tis an antidote against beating. Keep your hand from your sword and your laundress's petticoats, and you'll live at peace. I will, Colonel. Give me wisdom that is beaten into a man, for that sticks to him, egad. I'm wiser than a justice of peace. Your precepts are very learned. Sir, I'm your humble servant. Farewell, sword, and welcome tongue again. Now can't I positively tell whether tis best to be courageous or to have no courage at all? Beaten if I fight, and beaten if I do not. Now, I think I know something of the law, and yet if the question was put to me, I could not resolve it. But for my own part, I'll lay courage down, as all men do when they take up the gown. Cloaked with the law, I may securely bawl, and who affronts me then shall pay for all. Exit. Ha 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 ha. Enter Toper and gives the colonel a letter. Ah, colonel, opportunely met. I bring an express from the Queen of Beauty. Her orders are in that paper. Ha, tis Clorinda's hand. Reads. I hope by this time you are satisfied of my innocence, as I am of yours. If not... I beg you by all the ties of honour to rescue me from this foolish knight to whom I am this moment to be married by the rigid command of my barbarous father. And if I don't clear your censures, use me as you please. Yours, Clorinda. Rescue thee, yes. The fool shall quit all pretensions to thee unless this arm deceives me. If it does, boy, here's another at thy service. You may seize her at the end of the street as she passes. Be sure you marry her as soon as you have got her. Let me alone to bring her fortune. The captain must help our plot forward as soon as he has helped you away with her. With all my heart, I love mischief. I have a plaguy hankering mind after this cousin, though, ere since Manly, told me she has ten thousand pounds. The yoke should be well lined, or twill be very uneasy at best. Aye, there must be gold proportionable to the alloy, or twould it not be current coin. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Well, I'm a good-natured fellow now to spend my time in your business when I have an assignation with one of the prettiest girls about town, Faith. Some old o'erworn drab, I'll warrant, cast off by the bows in town, now has become a new face to the drunkards. No, Faith, she's a kept mistress. She cost me not a sou. Thou art still laboring between two tides, wine and women, Wilt thou never take up till thou art confined by a doctor to dry diet? Dry diet? You don't mean a wife, I hope. Catch me at that meat and choke me with it. That's just as a confinement to sea biscuit at land. Though I'd do you all the service I can, Colonel, in helping you to your mistress, yet I can't help lamenting the loss of a friend. Why, will matrimony lose me to my friends? I shall love them as well as ever, I assure you. Aye, but your friends won't care that... Snapping his fingers. For you. For ere the second bottle, you'll be calling, What's to pay? Your wife won't go to bed till you come home. This makes company uneasy. And what makes us uneasy decreases our value for it. For my part, 
I had rather be confined to seamen in a storm, or the malicious conversation of a Jacobite club, than the company of a married man. For at every mouse stirring I should think the comforts of matrimony were coming, with all their commanding retinue. A wife, egad! I'd rather want wine, the only support of the body. Well, you declare for a bottle, I for a wife, which I think the greater pleasure far. Where shall we find you? At the Rose. Exit. Adieu. Bellamine shall come to you there. Let fools be fettered to that clog, a wife. Whilst free, I reap the pleasure of my life. And heaven grant I may no longer live, than I can taste the joys which wine doth give. Exit. A clash of swords. Sir William cries, Murder! Colonel and Clorinda, Belmain and Amelia cross the stage. Haste, my fairest, and let us tie that knot which naught but death can loose. Exit. Enter careful. Certainly. I heard Sir William's voice cry murder. Enter Sir William. What's the matter, Sir William? Where's my daughter? Be feeble, me, if I know. You had best send after her immediately, or she'll be married to Manly, who drew upon me. And if I had not quitted her, it'd run me quite through the body, impair my vigour. This was her project of going on foot. She would not have the coach under pretence of notice being taken, forsooth, and your persuasion made me go before to get the parson ready. Odds flesh! Had I been there, this had not happened. Old as I am, they should not have escaped so easily. It's death! Let a man take your mistress from you. In my conscience, young fellows are so rotten nowadays, they are afraid of every scuffle, lest they drop in pieces. Aside. Zounds! I could curse them as I got this bastard. To think what a fortune she has lost. Do take my breeding to have been at a bear garden, sir, or a bedlam to endanger my life for your daughter? No, let her go. I'd marry an actress sooner have more hopes of her virtue. Say you so, Mr. Dirty Crown. A dod. I could find in my heart to dash the powder out of your horse hair for you. Your age protects you, sir. Exit. Well... If I don't fit the baggage, I'm mistaken. Egad. I'll marry Topher's niece immediately. Enter Topher. Mr. Topher, you came, luckily. I am resolved to marry your cousin this moment. Nay, I'll settle all I have upon her. I'll hamper my daughter. I'll warrant her. I came to inform you, sir, that I saw Colonel Manley and your daughter enter the church. The parson met them at the door, and I'm much afraid they will be married before you can get to them. Let her marry and be poxed. I'll not give her a farthing. I'm resolved. Let her go a soldiering with her husband, and carry his knapsack like a trull as she is. If there be any favour or interest to be had in an English parliament, I'll have the parson turned out of his place for a jackbite that coupled them. I have a friend of mine at the Rose. Just come from Oxford. If you please, Mr. Careful, I'll fetch him, and you may be married in your own house. Exit Toper. With all my heart. Adored, methinks I'm brisk and young again, this audacious wench. My blood boils high, and all my spirits move. Revenge gives strength to age as much as love. Exit. End of the fourth act. Act Five of The Bow's Duel, or A Soldier for the Ladies, by Susanna Sentliver. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One. Scene, Careful's House. Careful leading in Mrs. Plotwell. Well, my dearest Anne, I think myself the happiest man alive since I espoused thee. I have settled my whole estate upon thee, which, with this kiss, I do confirm to thee again. Offers to kiss her. Ah, 
pray forbear sir how wife refuse to kiss me yes except a sweeter air come from you <sighs> you have turned my stomach i wonder you can ask me knowing your lungs are perished mercy upon me what have i married here where are my servants enter a maid run to the exchange fetch me a french nightgown and french head set my dressing-table in order do you hear let my paint powder and patches be ready oh lord oh lord paint powder and patches why harkee mistress are you not a quaker <laughs> no sir i only made use of that disguise to catch you in but you have money enough to equip me after the fashion and that was the only motive of my sanctity oh undone undone look you sir i shall never endure your conversation i must have two beds two chambers and two tables it was an article of our agreement you know that i should live retired that is a part sir a curse on that agreement but harkee wife are you not in earnest sure in earnest why do you think i jest with age and you won't bed with me did ever man of your hairs ask such questions i vow i blush at your unreasonableness oh monstrous is it fit i should be buried for to bed with you were a direct emblem of my going to my grave mercy upon me where is this rogue this topher what damned succubus has he topped upon me i'll have your picture set in my wedding ring to put me in mind of mortality do you think i'll come within your winding sheets for what i am married pray why did you marry in my conscience you're as youthful as a coffin and as hot as the sultry winter that froze over the thames they say the hard time did begin from you <laughs> oh heavens i made the curse of all mankind oh patience patience harkee mistress you that have a fever and dog days in your blood if you knew this why did you marry me that your experienced aches that have felt springs and falls these forty years should ask such a question <laughs> as if i could not find friends to supply your cold defects do you think a young woman high in her blood careful aside and hot as goats and marmosets apt to take flame at any temptation careful aside and kindle at the picture of a man would wed dust and ashes unless she were cracked tried or broken up ha right sir or lacked a cloak mischief in hell is there none to make your cloak but me not so well lined sir <laughs> oh you stayed for a wealthy cuckold did you your tame beasts should have gilded horns besides sir i thought your age would wink at stolen helps if i took comfort from abroad yes yes you shall have comfort i'll deliver letters for you or hold the door no sir i'll not give you that trouble i'll have a maid shall do that making a curtsy oh impudence unheard of impudence but sir i look your coffers should maintain me at my rate how's that pray why like a lady i must have united for i don't like mistress my lady would sound better careful aside yes i shall rise to honour i must have six horses in my coach four are fit for those that have a charge of children you and i shall never have any if we have all middlesex will be their fathers i'll have four footmen and this house cleared of all this old lumber and new wainscoted and lined with looking-glass have cabinets screw towers and china mercy upon me hark i mistress you told me you loved retirement hated visits and bargained for hours of devotion right sir but what woman speaks truth before she's married politically answered and like one perfect in the sinning trade 
well sir don't discompose yourself twill signify nothing i'll in and examine your jewels choose some for every day and some for masks and balls exit the devil go with you oh that i had my daughter again two days more of this and i shall grow mad or to redeem myself dash out my brains exit scene changes to plotwell's lodgings enter on one side the colonel clorinda and amelia on the other belmain and toper we have done your business colonel belmain here has tacked em together and out the form of matrimony as gravely as if i had taken my degree at edinburgh and how does it take oh admirably well i listened a while and found she managed it rarely she'll drive my father out of his wits well captain uh, you'll observe what i told you i'll follow you with another project i warrant you will give the old fellow enough of matrimony colonel do you be ready when i call to come in do you hear i fancy they are in such confusion that it would be no hard matter for all of you to get into the house unseen we'll endeavour it but hark ye madam there's something more to be said before you and i part have you the conscience to let your friend launch into the sea of matrimony alone to choose sir for if the voyage prove dangerous one at a time is enough to be lost would you have her surrender under the first summons captain you must expect some fatigue in love as well as war the little disquiet of hopes and fears do but enhance the value of a mistress when gained soldiers and knight-errants should court danger and despise an enterprise that had no difficulty in it ay madam if i had but the hopes of a carnival after this lent twould be a sufficient recompense but expectation and uncertainty is the worst food in the world for a fellow of my constitution come madam be generous you cannot have an honester fellow i'll say that for him look ye there madam he'll vouch for me if you don't think my own word sufficient i shall trust nobody's judgment but my own and that tells me you are too much a libertine for a husband why you have not the least resemblance of a lover no resemblance why i'm a perfect skeleton do but see how pale and wan i look my tailor shall swear i am fallen away six inches in the waist since this day seven night and if these be no signs of being in love the devil's in it <laughs> very violent symptoms truly have you any more of them sir a thousand but do feel here the palpitation of my heart the irregularity of my pulse the emotion of my brain in short my whole frame is deformed and without immediate help i'm a dead man aside i'm quite out of breath i hope she won't put me to the expense of any more lies for certainly i have told and now to deserve any one woman in christendom poor gentleman well if your distemper continues i'll consult my pillow for a remedy take me with you to that study madam the sight of me there will very much improve your understanding embracing her come i hope to see thee blessed as i am to clorinda and now my fairest my whole study shall be to make you happy well madam you had as good give me my answer not until i see the event of your plot upon my uncle exit come come she's thine boy for though at first the sex our suit deny press em but home and they will all comply scene careful's house careful solace mercy upon me what shall i do well thought right enough served old boy eh pox of thy old doting head 
beats his head. Thou must marry for revenge, must thou? I am revenged with a witness. Enter Belmain. Sir, your servant, I come, sir, to do you a piece of service, if it be not too late. I heard just now that one toper had lodged a woman under pretense of a cousin in your house. Oh, heavens! I'm become the town talk already. Well, sir, and what then? She's a common strumpet, sir. How, sir? Have a care what you say. I'll prove it, sir. She's of known practice. The clothes she wears are but her quarters sins. She has no lining but what she first offends for. Oh, I sweat, I sweat. Sir, she has known men of all nations and lain by two parts of the map, Africa and America. Oh, 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 oh. What ails you, sir? Are you not well? Oh, undone, undone. I am married, sir. Nay, then, heaven help you. Why would you trust Toper, the debauchedest fellow in town? She was once his mistress. Money falling short, I suppose. He has topped her upon you, and is to be maintained out of your bags. Oh, I've settled all I have in the world upon her, that damned rascal. Oh, that I could see him stretched upon a rack now. I'd give a thousand pounds every stretch that should but show him hell, and then rascal his fleeting soul, and give him strength to endure his torment often. I'd have him as long a dying as a chopped eel. Enter two footmen, bearing in a frame of a picture with a curtain before it. What have we here? My lady has sent your wife a present, sir. Who is your lady? My lady Manlove. Pray, what is it? A picture for her bedchamber, sir. For her bedchamber? There are but one sort of pictures will please my wife there. Pray draw back the curtain. My lady charged that none should see it but your wife, sir. Say you so, sir, but I will see it. Draws the curtain, and Toper comes out of the frame. Hell and damnation! Are you there, bored, panda, sirrah? I'll cut your ears off. Draws. Belmain holds him. Hold, sir. I must prevent your running into further mischief. If you kill him, the law pursues you. The law? Who would scruple hanging to be revenged on such a dog? Sirrah, you are a villain. Sir, you are rude and should be beaten. Can't a man come in private, on business to your wife? But you must be inquisitive. Why, this is beyond example. Why do you hold me, sir? This is death. I shall be cuckolded before my face. Enter Mrs. Plotwell. Oh, are you come? I thought your husband, to keep you chaste, had set a guard of eunuchs over you, or shot you up in a room, where no male beast is pictured. For I find he is as jealous already as an Italian. I wonder, sir, who licensed you to pry or spy out my friends that come to me in private. It would be more to your reputation to trust to my management than to be peeping. But it shows your unbred curiosity, which I shall correct. Zounds! This is beyond the suffering of a saint. Let me go and I'll slit her nose. Thou woman double-stamped! You'll dare to break up letters shortly, and examine my tailor when he brings home my gown, lest there be a man in it. I'll have you to know, sir, I'll have whom I please, and in what disguise I please, and not have your eyes so saucy to peep, as if by prevention you meant to kill a basilisk. Mercy on me! I shall lose my understanding. Cousin Toper, I'll fetch you the hundred pound immediately. Exit. A hundred pound? Oh, oh, oh. I vow, sir, I am very much concerned at your misfortune. If I was in your place, I'd take my daughter home. The colonel is a man of honor, and will at least secure you from such affronts as these. Ah, poor girl. But I have not a farthing to give her. This damned woman has got all. 
Suppose I contrive a way to null your marriage. Would you forgive your daughter? With all my soul. What would you give for such a project, huh? As much as I'd give to see you hanged, which is all I am worth. <laughs> well, you'd forgive me too, would you not? Aye, though thou hast murdered my father and debauched my mother. Say you so, sir. Well, I'll be with you in an instant. Exit. But which way will you do it, sir? Why, you have not consummated yet, have you? No, thank heaven. Well, then, take you no care. You'll give your daughter the same fortune you designed for the fop knight. Aye, that I will, and five hundred pounds more. Come in, lovers. The scene's changed. Enter Colonel Clorinda, Amelia, and Toper. Colonel kneels. Your blessing, sir. And with it your pardon. You have it. Why did I get unmarried again? Well, now call for your lady. Oh, here she comes. Enter Mrs. Plotwell. Zounds! I tremble at the sight of her. <laughs> you shan't need, sir, for my fury is over. I wish you joy, madam. And, sir, I here resign you up your settlement again. Gives him papers. How's this? Ha! Huh. Pray unfold this mystery. Why, sir, this is Mrs. Plotwell, your neighbor, who only put on this disguise to be serviceable to your daughter. This honest gentleman here was the parson that coupled you. Now, sir, I think I've kept my word with you. Very well. Why, truly, sir, being loath to see this young lady thrown away upon a fool when she had the prospect of such a worthy match as Colonel Manley, I undertook to reduce you to your reason, and I don't doubt but you'll own I have done you a piece of service in forcing you to exclude a blockhead out of your family, and in his stead receive a man of sense and honour. Tis now, madam, my turn to pay my acknowledgments for this unexpected goodness instruct me pray which way i may be grateful if i have done good it rewards itself and if mr careful pleases to pardon the frolic i shall be overpaid with all my heart i faith the frolic was a pretty frolic now tis over enter sir william mode I heard she was married, Mr. Careful. I wish you joy. You are mistaken, Sir William. Tis my daughter that is married. Sir William aside. Huh. The Colonel married to my mistress. Sir William, I desire all quarrels between you and I may be cancelled. Pray include me in that treaty too, Sir William. Here has been strange juggling, Sir William. I have been tricked out of my consent. I hope you'll pardon me, too. Sir William aside. I am in such confusion that I know not what to say, but I must show them that my soul's above an affront, and that nothing can disorder the serenity of my temper. I, we are all friends, gentlemen, and I forgive the lady, too for she has done more honestly by me than most women would. She has married the man she liked, though it is the fashion to take the rich husband they don't like and make a friend of the man they do. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I desire you'd make clear to me, madam, which is, why did you give me encouragement by your woman? I give you encouragement by my woman? What do you mean? I beg your pardon, madam. His gold prevailed upon me, and I thought what I said would signify nothing. I hope you will forgive me. Never. Out of my doors. I suppose through your management Ogle was so familiar with me, too. Out of my sight! Exit maid. Indeed, my dear, I cannot intercede in her behalf since through her means my first suspicion came that made us both uneasy 
but as to ogle i sufficiently revenged your quarrel for i'll engage he never sets up for a bow again confound your whole sex you're all not worth a gentleman's anger out to my lodgings and send for the music and think no more of you nor matrimony if i do i'll give em leave to ram me into an oat boy and blow me out of the hose and pair my vigour exit <laughs> 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 well madam what say you have you a mind to see me sing to elysium in my garters and hear me sung about in a ballad to a doleful new tune called the gentleman's farewell to his unkind lady or will you take pity on me well sir to prevent such sad disasters i don't care if i give you my hand and as you deserve my heart shall follow ay give me but the body and i'll warrant you i'll get the rest hey day what a wedding chopped up there too well i never shall believe common report again that all women are jacobites since i find them so ready towards a soldier's service to the nation with their persons and fortunes i wish every brave man was rewarded according to his merit i'm certain captain belmine deserves more than i can give him don't compliment your husband madam you don't know half my deserts yet brave boys brave boys enter servant sir here's the music without come to congratulate your marriage bid em come in we'll have a dance here a dance well gentlemen i wish you joy if there can be any such thing in a wife but for my part it shall always be my maxim not to part with my liberty till i can't help it what bird would be confined in a cage when it can skip from tree to tree colonel i'll come and take a bottle with you by and by exit madam you deserve our best thanks for this exemplary piece of justice and be assured you have laid an eternal obligation on me i am pleased that i have done you service and henceforth shall devote myself to virtue and i hope heaven will pardon the follies of my past life blessed in my love i envy no man's fate content alone is the true happy state virtue thou shining jewel of my sex thou precious thing that none knows how to value as they ought while they enjoy it but like spendthrift heirs when they have wasted all their store would give the world they could retrieve their lost estate therefore beware you happy maids how you listen to the deluding tongues of men tis only they have power to betray you o oh, happy she that can securely say folly be gone i have no mind to play my fame is clear i have not sinned to-day end of act five the epilogue by the author you see gallants has been our poet's care to show what bows in their perfection are by nature cowards foolish useless tools made men by tailors and by women fools a fickle false a singing dancing crew nay now we hear they've smiling masters too just now a frenchman in the dressing-room from teaching of a bow to smile was come he showed five guineas wasn't he rarely paid thus all the world by smiles are once betrayed the statesman smiles on them he would undo the courtier's smiles are very seldom true the lover's smiles too many do believe and women smile on them they would deceive when tradesmen smile they safely cheat with ease and smiling lawyers never fail of fees the doctor's look the patient's pain beguiles 
The sick man lives if the physician smiles. The smiles with interest hand in hand do go. He surest strikes that smiling gives the blow. Poets with us this proverb do defy. We live by smiles, for if you frown, we die. To please you then shall be our chief endeavor, and all we ask is but your smiles forever. Going, hold, I forgot, the author bid me say. She humbly begs protection for her play. Tis yours she dedicates it to you all, and sure you're too generous to let it fall. She hopes the ladies will her cause maintain, since virtue here has been her only aim. The bows, she thinks, won't fail to do her right, since here they're taught with safety how to fight. She's sure of favor from the men of war. A soldier is her darling character. To fear the murmurs then would be absurd, they only mutiny when not preferred. But yet I see she does your fury dread, and like a prisoner stands with fear half dead. While you, our judges, do her sentence give. If you're not pleased, she says she cannot live. Let my petition then for once prevail, and let your generous claps her pardon seal. End of the Bow's Duel or Soldier for the Ladies by Susanna Sentliver.